Sweden's highest mountain, at just below 2,100 meters, appears relatively low in comparison to other alpine peaks. However, the mountain should not be underestimated, as climbing the mountain is a challenge far beyond the ordinary. You have to be prepared for everything. The challenge of the Swedish mountains is the changeable weather. You can expect 30 degrees Celsius and you can expect snowstorms. So it's really changeable and you have to be prepared for that, which means that you have to pack uh, gear for all these kinds of conditions. I have set out to climb both the western and eastern route to the southern and northern summit of the mountain. Together with Pan and Sion, the sports director at Kebnekaise Mountain Station, I will guide you through our climbs and we will share our best tips for a successful ascent as well as a safe and enjoyable experience. Hela leden är ju tekniskt enkel men väldigt fysiskt svår. Alltså det, det är en jättejobbig led eh, att vandra. Och det tror jag många tar lite, lite lätt på. Östra leden är ju ungefär 14 km station till station och västra leden är ju nästan 20 km. Att ta sig upp till sidtoppen är ju och förblir en jätteutmaning för väldigt många. Det är ju på håret att många klarar sig. Så att än så länge så går ju de flesta till sidtoppen och sen fortsätter några över då. Men det är, ju, det är ju exponerad terräng, så du måste ju veta vad du gör vid ett eventuellt fall. Faller man på via för att man så sitter ju en 11 mm stålvajer som håller fast dig på berget. Ett fall utan rep eller så på väg till nordtoppen är ju fatalt. Det överlever du inte. A few days earlier, I start my journey from Nikkelukta, a small village located about 70 kilometers by car west of Kiruna. To get here, I've taken the 9 train from Stockholm and then a bus from Kiruna. In front of me, I have 19 kilometers of trail to Kebnekaise mountain station, which works as a base camp for most climbers. The trail from Nikkelukta is relatively flat and easy to follow. It's marked by red paint on rocks and around trees. There are plenty of routes that go to the top, but the most common one that people do is the eastern and the western route. And both of them start by the Kebnekaise mountain station. The western route you can hike on your own. I think that some people might see it as the easy route because you don't have to have a guide to do it. But it's long and it is technical. It's a long technical hike. The eastern route you have to have a guide to do or be an experienced alpine climber because it goes over a glacier and it has a via ferrata. By the Lake Lajujaure, about five kilometers in, you can skip a section of roughly six kilometers by taking a boat ride. This goes on set time during the summer and costs about 400 Swedish crowns one way. Another option is to hike in from the west, along a section of the famous Swedish hiking trail Kungsleden. By the Singe Huts, there is a 14 km long trail that leads off towards the Kebnekaise mountain station. Starting your climb from here with a few days of hiking is a good way to give your body a chance to adjust to the long days of hiking. But if your time is limited, starting from Nikalukta works fine too. After a full day on the trail, I reached the mountain station in the evening. 
My plan is to start with the western route, and to save myself some time, I decide to keep hiking and make camp a few kilometers up the trail. The first thing you should be aware of is that there are several junctions just after the station. So make sure you keep your eyes open and follow along at your map. Don't just follow the people in front of you, as they might have a different plan. Even though some refer the western route as the easy route, that is far from the truth. Even though it doesn't have the technical features as the eastern route, it's much longer with more altitude meters to climb. The alpine terrain with boulders, rocks, gravel and loose ground is also quite steep in plenty of places, which can make it quite slippery. I therefore recommend to hike in boots to protect your feet from the sharp rocks, but also to keep them dry and warm as you might walk across water and snow. If you choose to hike up the mountain on your own, you must keep in mind that you're far away from roads, meaning that you're very exposed to the conditions and need to be able to take care of yourself if something happens. There is a mountain rescue team, but if the weather is bad, they may not even be able to set out to help you, or it might take a long time. Therefore, I would only recommend hiking up the western route on your own if you have experience of hiking in the Swedish mountains. That way you can predict what kinds of risk you might face and how to prevent or handle them. If you don't have the experience, it's better to climb the mountain with a guide. Or of course start by getting the experience. As I have spent a lot of time in the mountains, and also been up the mountain before, I feel safe going up on my own. But of course I'm also a bit nervous. As each climb is unique, you never know exactly what to expect and what the challenge will be this time. One thing is for sure, it will be a challenge, no matter how experienced you are. Packing for a climb is not the easiest thing. You have to be prepared for everything, but at the same time you need to pack as light as possible. You will need rain gear, warmer clothes and accessories like sunglasses and micro spikes or crampons if it's icy on the top. You will also need food that you can eat as you go, snacks and water and of course safety equipment. A first aid kit with blister tape, bandage, hand warmers etc is great, but also remember that you might have to wait a long time for help if something happens, which can mean spending the night on the mountain. Make sure you can keep warm in the meantime. In case of an emergency, you call 112 to SOS alarm and if they find that you're in need of help, they will send out the mountain rescue team. They will risk a lot to set out for an emergency alarm, so never make the call if you don't really need it. But at the same time, don't hesitate if you really do. The cell service is pretty good, but I always bring an emergency device from which I can send out an emergency message by satellite if I don't have service. Be aware that the cold will drain your batteries, so also bring a power bank for your electronic devices and keep this somewhere protected from the cold. I am always hiking with poles, especially if I'm climbing a mountain. It will help you a lot, both on the way up and on the way down when you're tired. It's also a way to prevent and handle accidents. They can help you if it's slippery, and they can work as crutches or splints if something happens. When I leave camp to start my climb, I can leave it as it is, with my tent up and all my other gears inside it. And if you do so, make sure you have put it up properly, with all the storm lines tightened, as your camp may also be exposed to bad weather during the day. Three kilometers in, the trail makes a right turn and goes up a valley called Schitteldalen. 
This is on the right side of the characteristic mountain Tolpagorni, which has a big crater or cauldron at the top. Actually, it's believed that this was the mountain that was originally called Kebnekaise, but that the names later got mixed up by early land surveyors. This, as the North Sami name, basically means the cauldron top. The western route is about 19 kilometers to the top and back and takes between 10 to 16 hours for most people. The trail is marked all the way, first with red paint on rocks and then with reflective poles with red dots as you enter the alpine terrain. The trail follows the stream Kittelbecken up towards a big bridge. This is the last place to fill up with water. Make sure you fill up enough for the upcoming hours. You won't find any more water until you return here again. How much water you need depends on the weather and how much water you normally drink during hard activities. On a hot day, you will of course need much more. Take at least one and a half liter if you're not sure. The water is said to be safe enough to drink direct from the stream, but if you want to be 100% safe, you can always bring a filter. As you walk, you might feel warmer or colder due to your level of exercise and the changing weather on the mountain. Therefore, it's recommended to dress in layers and adapt them to the current conditions. Keep warm, but make sure you don't get sweaty, as that will make you cold as you cool down. As you walk, keep an eye on your map once in a while and make sure you know where you are at all times. A good idea is to download maps to your phone, for example with apps like Swedish Topo Maps or Min Karta, which you can use even if you don't have service. On these apps you can see where you are by GPS, but never rely solely on electronic devices. Always bring a map and compass as well. After the bridge you will soon face some stairs. These stairs was built in 2016 and 17 by hand by Sherpas from Nepal. Before that, this was a place where most of the accidents happened on the mountain. The steep and rocky terrain was hard for many, especially when walking down after a long day out and if it was rainy. Since the stairs was built, the number of accidents has reduced dramatically. The weather changed fast. I mean, it, just these two, three hours I've been out, it's been sunny, it's been cloudy, foggy. It hasn't rained yet, but I'm sure that will come too. After the stairs, you find yourself in a saddle between Tolpagorni and the mountain Vieramvari. The trail continues up to the right about 250 altitude meters, all the way to the top of Vieramvari. It's steep and the gravel has a tendency to roll under your feet, so take it easy, but steady. One step at a time. At the top you will face countless piles of rocks and if you're lucky, you can get an amazing view of the Kebnekaise Massive and Björlings Glacier. However, what you also see in front of you is probably what makes most people turn around. From the top, you have to make a steep descent about 200 altitude meters down to the valley Kaffedalen, and from there, the trail turns straight back up again. The view of the trail on the other side can be really demotivating. One of the most important things on all my adventures is to be prepared for setbacks and try to predict and plan when and where they may come. Because they will come no matter how big or how small challenge you have in front of you. 
When you get to that point where it all feels like a struggle, your own mind is going to work against you. It's going to come up with all different kinds of reasons why the whole thing is a bad idea and why you should stop and turn around. You might even ask yourself, why am I doing this? If in advance you have gone through the climb and pointed out some spots where the struggle might come, for example on the top of the arm body, then it's much easier to accept the thoughts, but then also let go of them and continue. Because if you'll keep going, after you pass that critical spot, you will feel much stronger and the bad thoughts will go away. In this way, climbing a mountain is very much like meditation. You need to let go of your thoughts and focus on the present. A little bit more than a kilometer, but 350 altitude meters after Kafedalen, you will reach the first top cabin. This is also called the old top cabin and is located about one kilometer from the top. 700 meters later, there is a second top cabin, the new one. In these cabins, you can find shelter from bad weather or take a break to have some snacks. Spending the night in them is only allowed in case of emergency, and if there are woods in them, it's also just for emergency use. The cabins are also no place to leave your trash. Everything you bring to the mountain, you should bring back down again and back home. That also includes toilet paper. There are no toilets along the trail, so if you need to go, walk a bit of trail, but make sure you can find your way back. A friend or a marker is good to have in sight. Then, cover up your business and lit up your toilet paper. Or even better, bring everything down in a separate bag. No trash whatsoever should be left on the mountain. The southern summit is located on top of a small glacier, and the last part up to it can be quite slippery, depending on the weather the previous days. It's also steep and exposed, so remember to take it easy. Ask the staff at the station about the conditions, and rent crampons if you need to. I like to bring microspikes regardless of the conditions, as it makes me feel more safe. As I finally reach the top, I feel relieved and happy. But at the same time I know that reaching the top of the mountains only means being halfway. Now I have to do the same thing all over again, and the way down can be even harder, as I don't have that luring top to help my motivation. This is another mentally challenging spot that is good to be prepared for. Also be aware of this on your way up. You have to be strong enough to also make it back down. Turn around if it gets too much. As I'm heading down, the weather is gradually getting worse, and I have to keep my eyes on the markers so I don't lose them. Kebnekaise is not the place to wander out into the unknown. There are lots of loose rocks and cliffs around. There's some bad weather that has been coming in. It's snowing, which makes it even harder to see. Uh, I can see like one or two markers ahead, but not more than that. I think we'll be fine. We have some equipment with us if we have to wait it out, but this is what can happen. It was perfect views on top and now it's almost nothing.
After several hours, I finally come back to my camp. It's been a long, challenging day, very typical for the Swedish mountains. The challenge of the Swedish mountains is the changeable weather. Uh, you have to expect everything when you hit out on a hike. You can expect 30 degrees Celsius and you can expect snowstorms. So it's really changeable and you have to be prepared for that. But if you are, that's also the experience that makes it so unique and so cool to see all these kinds of changes and to experience that so close. I mean, when you're out here, you really have to rely on yourself, on your gear, that you have what it takes, even if it gets really bad. I think that is what I love about the Swedish mountains. They really make you feel alive. The next morning I returned to the mountain station. Here I booked a bed to get a good night's sleep before tomorrow's climb up the eastern route. The station is run by STF, the Swedish Tourist Association, and has everything from single rooms to bunk beds in dormitories, and the prices starts at 600 Swedish crowns with a discount for STF members. If you want to stay at the station, remember to book far in advance, as the spots tend to fill up pretty early in the season. You can also stay in your own tent close to the station, and for a service fee you get to use the facilities such as toilet, showers, drying rooms, sauna, etc. The station also have a shop, a weather station, a guide office with rental equipment and a restaurant that serves breakfast, lunch and a three-course dinner, which you have to book in advance. The station is open during the entire summer season, which means from late June to late September. As the winter stays longer in the north, big amount of snow and meltwater will be an issue earlier than so. Later in the fall, there is a risk of big snowfalls and icy sections. The winter season is from the beginning of March to late April. Then you climb the mountain on skis. It's great to plan for some extra days at the station in case of bad weather. Then you can make your summit attempt when you have the best chances of good weather. If you keep an eye on the weather a couple days ahead, you can see how it develops and what might become an issue when you're there. Be aware that the forecast is just a forecast and that the weather can change fast as you're up the mountain. In the evening I will meet up with Pad, who will be my partner for tomorrow's climb up the eastern route. As the eastern route goes over a glacier, it's something that you should only do with a guide or someone who is an experienced alpine climber that knows how to calculate glaciers and safely travel across them. So if you plan to hire a guide for the eastern route, make sure that they are authorized for the climb. Not all who arrange trips to the mountain are so. How does it look in the morning? I've looked at the prognosis and it looks just now. A little wind and a lot of sun. But strange things have happened. Ja. Att en prognos ändras, men, men just nu så ser det jättebra ut. Så det vi ska, vi ska plocka lite grejer åt det. Mm. Stegjärn, vi har fratta slinga, hjälm. Och det här är stegjärn som passar till vanliga Det passar till alla. Och en sele eh, med vi har fratta slingor och falldämpare då. Nu tänker jag, vi ska ju gå östra leden. Är det något som alla fixar, tycker du? Jag eller? tror att alla klarar det, alltså själva klättringen, tekniskt sett. Man kan säga så här, det är tekniskt enkelt, men väldigt exponerat. Ja. Så är man väldigt höjdrädd så kommer man inte ha, då kommer man inte ha kul. Hur lång tid tror vi att det tar ungefär? Mellan 9 och 11 timmar. Ja. Det beror helt på vad det är för, för förhållanden. Ja. Eh, är det mycket snö så går det mycket fortare. Det kommer ju gå ganska långsamt. Så vi kommer pausa ungefär fem minuter. Och den pausen är ju inte för att vi ska återhämta oss. Då, då går vi ju för fort, då måste vi sänka farten. Så du ska bara äta lite nötter och dricka vatten. Och sen två gånger, två gånger under dagen så kommer vi ha lite längre. Så då äter vi ganska enkel 
mackor eller någonting som går ganska fort. Så vi kommer inte ha med oss någon påsmat eller någonting. Så ganska enkel lunch och så ser vi till att vi är hemma i god tid så vi kan äta ordentlig mat här nere sen då. Så mackor och lite snacks? Ja, ganska mycket snacks tycker ja. man. Så man kan gå små och äta i farten. Eh, hela tiden komma bort från, när man går upp på Kemnekaj så måste man komma bort från att det är en fjällvandring. Eh, nu ska vi göra en alpin bestigning. Så då måste man hela tiden vara effektiv. Så att man är i rörelse. Och då innebär det att när man gör, om man inte gör någonting under en paus så, så gör man fel. Nu ska vi gå över till Nordtoppen också imorgon. Och det är egentligen inte något som är i den ordinarie turen till Östra Leden. Eller? Att ta sig upp till Sydtoppen är ju och förblir en jätteutmaning för väldigt många. Så att än så länge så går ju de flesta till Sydtoppen. Och sen fortsätter några över då. Men visst är det också lite mer avancerat att ta sig över? Definitivt. Eh, och det är väl också lite som östra leden. Eh, man ska ju inte överdriva svårigheten. Men det är, ju, det är ju exponerad terräng. Så du måste ju veta vad du gör vid ett eventuellt fall. Så det kanske är låg risk men höga konsekvenser om man faller. Faller man på via för att så sitter det ju en... 11 mm stålvajer som håller fast dig på berget. Ett fall utan rep eller så på väg till Nordtoppen är ju fatalt. Det överlever du inte. To be as alert as possible, it's good to start a climb early in the morning. This because you tend to be more focused in the day than during the evening. Even if the sun stays up all day round in the beginning of the season. At the restaurant I load up with a steady breakfast. Here I can also buy a lunch package consisting of sandwiches and snacks. Exactly the things Per have told me that I need for the climb. Outside the station, there are many groups waiting to set off. To spread out the people and minimize the risk of accidents, all the groups have different start times. So if you plan to do the eastern route on your own, make sure to team up with the guides at the station so that you can plan your time together. That way the mountain will be safe for all climbers. The eastern route is shorter than the western, about 14 kilometers back and forward, but it's more technical. This trail is not officially marked and does not have any markers as the western route. When the trail departs from the western route, it goes straight up along the stream Jökelbäcken, where it gets steep quite fast. After about 2.5 kilometers on the trail, you cross the stream by feet. Make sure to fill up with water here, as this is the last flowing water you will find on this route. After the stream, it gets really steep. Except for the Via Ferrata, this is the steepest section of the trail. The worst part of the slope usually takes about an hour. So even if it feels really hard, think of it as a gym class. Take it step by step and take it easy and have in mind that it will not go on forever. Then it flattens out a bit and you will walk over the moraine from the glacier, in other words over big boulders that the glacier has pushed aside on its way forward.
A glacier consists of ice that doesn't melt over summer, but it slowly moves by gravity. That means cracks, so-called crevasses, will appear on it. These cracks can be tens of meters deep and falling into them can be fatal, even with the right equipment. Some of them are visible, but they can also be covered by snow. As the sun warms up the snow during the day, following in other people's old footsteps is not a safe way of crossing. The snow might have been hard when they passed, but can collapse later in the day. Before you enter the glacier, you rope up, which means that you're tied to each other and in case someone falls through a crevasse, the other ones can hopefully hold the weight and stop the fall. Nu kör vi. Yes. Räcker vi ut det här? Hoppreppsavstånd va? Perfekt. Här är det ju, den här den är väldigt liten, eh, så kliva inte ner i den för då kommer du fastna. Eh, så att det är bara att kliva över. Anton, Anton från Per. Ja, kom igen. Hur ser det ut där uppe? Härligt att höra. Då kör vi på det. Små ras av det som har... Nu när solen börjar ligga på. Ja. Det var jag lite oroliga för i morse. Att det skulle ligga... Ibland när man kommer så är liksom hela väggen är som isblästrad. Ja. Och när solen då kommer och börjar lysa på det, då rasar det ju stora is. Kocken är. Så då kan man ju inte gå. Då får man ju, då får man ju faktiskt vända, ja. vända om och gå hem igen. Så det är ju trist. Men nu ser det ju fint ut. Ja. Men ni har ganska bra kommunikation mellan varann. Ja, all, alla guider eh, och de flesta, eh, liksom om det är andra guidegrupper eller bergsguider och så här, så det brukar vara ganska bra kommunikation. Alla har en radio med sig. Mm. Så, man, så man vet vart, vart man är någonstans. Det är ju ställen där man kommer vara ovanför varandra på klättringen och då är det bra att kolla på och veta vart man är. Eh, hela Svenska Bergskedjan är ju ganska lös. Eh, så det finns ju alltid en risk att eh, man petar ner någon sten. Mm. Så det är jätteviktigt att man har koll på vart eh, nästa grupp är någonstans. Ja, nu har vi en gäng framför oss. Ja, så att jag tycker vi, vi ger dem lite space. Så får de komma igång på krättringen och sen kan vi följa efter på ett schysst avstånd. Ja, vi får väl se hur det går. Ja. <laughs> nu är det lite snö också. Ja, det kan göra det både lättare och svårare så vi får, ja. vi får se hur det går. The glacier we're walking on is called Björlings Glacier, after the first Swedish person who climbed the mountain in 1889, Johan Alfred Björling. He actually never took a step on this glacier, but found his way up along the western route. When more people came to climb the mountain, the search for a faster way to the top started, and the eastern route got established. The first man who climbed the mountain, the Frenchman Charles Rabot, did so in 1883 and came from the west. But 
as the top glacier has melted, remains from what looks to be a sacrificial site has been found, which indicates that people have found a way up the mountain long before the explorers came across it. At the end of the glacier it gets steeper again, and you walk along a ridge up to the start of the Via Ferrata. A Via Ferrata is a climbing route on the mountain, on which you secure yourself with two slings from your harness that you click into a steel wire, which is bolted to the mountain. You will also need a helmet in case of falling rocks or ice. The Via Ferrata is about 200 meters of altitude. Sometimes you just walk, sometimes you need to use grips in the mountain, sometimes you can use the wire to drag yourself up, and sometimes there is a rope or steps that you can use. If you find it hard, my best tips is to take it step by step. Don't think too much and don't look down. Look instead where you place your hands and your feet and tell your guide if it feels scary and you will get a helping hand. After the Via Ferrata, the eastern route connects with the western route at the old top cabin and continues towards the southern summit. Before we walk up to the top glacier, we stop to put our crampons on and rope up again. From the southern summit you have to walk along a 700 meter exposed ridge to reach the northern summit. Here you will also walk with an ice axe, which you will use to arrest yourself in case of a fall. Det är väldigt exponerat första 70 metrarna, så då tar vi det ganska för riktigt. Och sen så blir det lite enklare terräng, då kan man slappna av lite mer. Så full fokus första 70 metrarna, så säger jag till när det, eller det kommer du känna också att det här blir ja. lite enklare. Så att vi kör. Okay. The southern summit of Kebnekaise has been the highest point of the mountain since the measurement started. At the first ascent it was measured to be close to 2130 meters above sea level, but today it's only 2094 meters. That is because the southern summit is on a dying glacier, which means that the snow that falls upon it during the winter can't keep up with the amount that is melting during the warmer months. The northern summit on the other hand is on rock, so that doesn't change. At 2097 meters, it means that it's now the highest of the peaks and has been so since 2018, but it also depends on the snowpack on the southern summit, which differs throughout the year. Walking over to the northern summit adds about an extra hour to the climb. Sista stegen. Snyggt. It's almost a surreal feeling to reach the top in these conditions, especially compared to the other day. According to Per, this is one of his three best climbs up the mountain, and he has been working here for almost 10 years. Around us, peaks are pointing up from the valleys below, and even though we know it's a long way back down again, we have to stop for a while and enjoy this rare moment.
Man ser ju hela, hela Sarex, liksom norra Högfjälls område. Om man kollar här, Akka till höger om? Höger om sydtoppen ja. så är Akka. Och sen om man till vänster så börjar Sarex och massivet. Ja. Det är en ganska stor samling av toppar mellan 18 och 2000 meter. I full sikt norr, norrut, västerut, överallt. Det är helt fantastiskt vindstilla. Vad brukar man säga att det tar att gå till sydtoppen? Sydtoppen varierar väldigt mycket från 8 timmar till 20 timmar. Ja. Det bör ju inte ta 20 timmar. Alltså då, har man, då har man fel taktik. Men det, upp och ner. Ja, det är väldigt många som är ute så länge. Och det, det tror jag är att man går, man går för fort. Man, man, man gör slut på sig och så måste man sitta under en längre period och återhämta sig. Mm. Istället för att gå lite långsammare och, och vara i rörelse hela tiden. Skulle du säga att det är det vanligaste misstaget? Ja, det tror jag. Ja, det skulle jag säga. Att det, folk går väldigt fort. Mm. Så pauserna blir alldeles, alldeles för långa. Mm. Så det tror jag det är det stora misstaget många gör. Och sen att man underskattar hur jobbigt. Det är, liksom. Bara miljön i sig är ju tuff. Ja. Men sen att också vara i den tuffa miljön under så lång tid ja. gör det ju liksom det är svårt tror jag att föreställa sig om man inte har varit på något liknande innan. Nej. Eh, vi har ju inte så mycket höga berg i Sverige och vi har ju inte en tradition av att gå upp på berg. Vi har ju en mer än en fjällvandringstradition. Mm. Vi har ju lite mer stilla sittande jobb. Folk har, tränar ganska mycket men man har inte tid att göra långpass utan man tränar en halvtimme, en timme, ganska hög intensitet. Man kör hjärnet under en timme men det är ju få som är ute och springer i tre, fyra timmar. Ja. Det händer ju inte så ofta. Men är det du skulle säga att om man vill träna för att bestiga Cabin Kaiser så är det... Uthållighet. Långt, uthållighet. uthållighet, uthållighet. Det är intensivt. Ja. Det är inte så ofta. Men det är ju när man gör sån här skidlopp, vasaloppet. Då är man ju ute under många timmar. Man får tänka lite, tänka lite som om man ska göra det när man tränar för det. Så tror jag att det kommer att gå jättebra. Så det är egentligen bättre att gå ut på den lokala vandringsleden en hel dag än att gå upp och ner för en skidbacke under en timme? Ja, definitivt. Det skulle jag säga. Sen så kan om du går i skidbacken under fyra timmar så tror jag att det kanske ger mer så. Så man får lite höjdmeter i, i, i benen. Eh, absolut. Ja, mättigt. Vi har en liten skidbacke tillbaka ner. Ja. Ja, det är väl lika bra att vi Börja be oss. Ja. Hälsa på dem som står borta på sidtoppen. Ja.